Hi, everyone, and welcome back to The Uncast. As usual, I am your host, Jonathan Panazzo, and on today's episode, we have to talk about Facebook's recent announcements. For those that missed it, Mark Zuckerberg recently announced their plans to create something they are calling the Metaverse. Now, to simplify this understanding for people, think a bit about the movie or book, depending on how old you are, uh, Ready Player One. A big difference is that in that movie, uh, everything in their Oasis world takes place inside a virtual reality. The metaverse, however, will allow you to interact with it in a traditional sense by using a device with a screen through augmented reality, where you can see virtual representations appear over real world objects. And of course, through virtual reality with a head mounted display of some sort. In the keynote, Zuckerberg provides some examples of how this could look and feel to users, but all that was displayed were mock-ups and they're not representative of anything actually usable or functional at this point. My initial feeling after seeing what he was talking about was a mixture of excitement and dread. More dread. Uh, The key, I'm sorry, the kid inside me gets giddy at the idea of virtual worlds we can create and make our own. Uh, Every sci-fi depiction of this in movies and TV just makes the geek in me get all excited. I mean, just imagine being able to design your own virtual space. You know, you could have any scenery, decorations, or other amenities that you want. You can also represent yourself as an avatar in any way you want. Be seen by everyone in whatever way you want to be seen. Sounds pretty amazing. But there were lots of things shown in this keynote that have me worried. Uh, Early on in the concept demonstration, there is a moment where someone is calling Mark from outside the metaverse to show him some augmented reality artwork that she found when walking around in the real world. While looking at the artwork, Mark comments that it's starting to fade away, but the caller says, I'll tip the artist so they can extend it. Now, If you don't pay close enough attention, you'd miss that statement, but it speaks heavily to the fact that this metaverse is going to be built entirely around a digital economy. Monetization is clearly going to be very important to them, and they mentioned things like blockchain and NFT to only drive home that point even further. In another segment, they show you how you could join a virtual after party for a concert, and they focus in on two friends browsing virtual merchandise that they can purchase, including apparel and posters they can then put in their virtual home space. Again, they are driving the message about spending in a virtual economy. In fact, Mark gets right into that after the demo, talking about creating a marketplace for creators that can then sell these digital items. Now, I'm all for content creators and developers finding a way to market and sell their goods. But what makes me nervous is the sheer amount of control that Facebook, excuse me, Meta, will have over your virtual world. The more they get you to invest in your personal metaverse avatar and home, the more leverage they have over you. Now, recently, my wife had her Facebook account compromised due to a breach and had to create a new one. Facebook provided a means for her to prove her ownership uh, of the original account by sending in pictures of her driver's license, but they never responded to her request and offer no means to contact them for status or escalation. Basically, Facebook cares about you until you need to talk to them about something, at which point you aren't a priority to them. The only thing they do seem to respond to is when people report content And they're relatively quick to react to those reports, some more than others. Now, in the end, my wife managed to create a new Facebook account, set up two-factor authentication, and got all her friends re-added. It was an investment of time for her to do that, but it didn't cost her any money. However, what if she was in the metaverse, and what if her reason for losing her account wasn't someone hacking it, but rather Facebook banning her for some reason? While the idea of the metaverse sounds great, the sheer amount of power and control that Facebook will have over it sounds terrible. It could be like Ready Player One, but where Sorrento, the bad guy, gets control of the Oasis. Who's to say how many ads will be displayed and what recourse banned users will have to getting back their virtual goods and human connections? Okay, let's stop for a second. Why are we talking about the metaverse on the Uncast exactly? Well, this all ties back to previous discussions about how cloud providers are rapidly advancing in their mission to replace traditional computing with a very Orwellian future, one in which big tech has a big red button that they can press at any time they want to remove you from their platforms, take away all of what you've built and obtained, and exile you from their virtual society. The beautiful thing about the way the internet was first created was the lack of centralized control and management. Imagine if there was only one domain name registrar. Imagine if there was only one hosting provider. Imagine if there was only one bandwidth provider. And worse off, imagine if all of these things were owned by the same company. That is essentially the aim of the metaverse. 
Zuckerberg wants to get there first in the same way that Valve was the first to create Steam for an online game store or the way that Apple introduced the iPhone. He wants to be the first to create a new way to experience connectivity with others online. With today's modern platforms like Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and the like, we interact with other humans using text, photos, and videos. All of these methods are flat and limiting in the way that we can absorb and react to them. By creating a virtual world with avatars that track everything about us, including our mannerisms, body language, and more, they will create an environment where connection and interaction with others is more immersive than ever. But when a company like Facebook is behind it, you have to assume that all of those intricacies not only tie into the experience, but into their monetization. Do you really want Facebook tracking even more of who you are? Do you want them knowing how, you're, how you contorted your face in response to reading an article or hearing about an event? So look, at the end of the day, a company as large as Facebook, having unilateral control over something as important as our own personal digital spaces and human connections is, again, a bit Orwellian. And I'm worried that through their subjective control over what is shared and with whom, Facebook could have an unhealthy level of authority over our society at large. Now, what would be even more amazing is if we could have the metaverse exist as independent hubs across our home servers. Each person's system could hold, uh, host their own private metaverse where they could still opt to purchase virtual merchandise or choose to create their own. The reason this would be better is that no one could come and take your virtual space down. No one could choose to limit who could participate in it. You could open it up or restrict it as much as you want and no overarching authority would be able to control what you would choose to do with it. And there is definitely more than enough horsepower on our home systems to power these virtual environments. Eventually, it will be possible, but it is up to us, the users, to demand it. I personally will not be participating in the metaverse and will strongly encourage my friends and family to stay away as well. Sorry, Mark, you're no holiday. Now, there's one other subject that I want to talk about today, uh, and that subject is about driver support. So I know <laughs> vastly different topics on the on the show, but uh, when it comes to driver support in Unraid, I want to talk about that for a minute because uh, sometimes people get confused about how their hardware will last over the tail of time when it comes to working with Unraid and Linux. The first thing that's worth mentioning is the fact that Unraid is built on Linux. It's using uh, the Linux kernel to drive everything in the product. And because of that, when it comes to hardware support, we, of course, are limited to what is supported by Linux and what hardware vendors choose to make their drivers work with Linux. Now, when it comes to driver support, there's something worth noting. In the Linux world, there's really two types of drivers that, that we think about, and those are in-tree and out-of-tree drivers. Now, if you have an in-tree driver, what that means is that the vendor of the driver or some open source person who decided to write one. Either way, they decided to produce a driver that is not closed source. It's open source and it's submitted directly to the Linux kernel. So when we compile our Linux kernel for a release of Unraid, we pull in drivers that are built into that Linux kernel. However, there's another kind of driver and these are out of tree drivers. And out of tree drivers are drivers that are also made by a company or an individual, but they are not merged into the Linux kernel for one of many reasons. One reason could be a licensing incompatibility. For example, there's a reason why ZFS currently is not a native part of the Linux kernel and it has to do with licensing. Um, it could also be that the vendor is trying to protect some type of proprietary technology in their hardware because they don't want that exposed in the source code. In either case, if we're dealing with an out-of-tree driver, the main difficulty there is that if it breaks, it is a lot more difficult for us to figure out how to fix it. In fact, we typically don't. Uh, more often than not, what we have to do is simply put out a notice that this driver is broken in this kernel release and hope that the vendor who is representing that driver updates it to work in that kernel. Now, you might be wondering, well, what makes a driver break? Sometimes there's changes in the kernel, changes to how things are referenced or, or organized, and the drivers that were built for previous kernels aren't ready to support those changes. And that's why there are times where you will go to upgrade Unraid and you might find that certain devices which worked prior no longer work. 
Unfortunately, there's really not a whole lot that we can do about this. We're not going to hold ourselves back to older kernel releases in order to support older hardware. That's not realistic, and it bottlenecks us from being able to support what the latest and greatest Linux kernels have to offer. So instead, what we ask is that if you have hardware that's specific like that, that, that is out of tree and doesn't have current drivers for the current release of Unraid, you're just going to have to stay on the older version until the kernel or the drivers or both get updated to support it. A good example of this is Tahuti Networks. For those that don't know, Tahuti uh, made 10 gigabit network cards for consumers uh, years ago. And they were trying to really make some inroads to bring 10 gig technology to the consumer market. Now, as a company, this sounded like a really great idea, but unfortunately, there's just not a lot of demand for that. Even today, there's not a lot of demand for 10 gig networking in a consumer uh, or a home environment. Uh, the main reason is that there's you know, not as much demand for bandwidth thanks to compression with video and things like that. Um, where you would really benefit from having that level of performance would only happen if your internet could perform that fast or if you were doing something so intensive locally, like video editing across the network on a NAS, um, that would actually be able to use that 10 gig. Because you don't really gain a lot in terms of latency or, uh, or, or ping just by moving to a 10 gig. You really just gain sheer bandwidth, and the need for that hasn't been that high. So why am I talking about Tahuti? Well, Tahuti went out of business, and Tahuti created several network cards that you could probably get for pretty cheap, probably even cheaper nowadays uh, on eBay or the otherwise. And these devices had Linux support with an out-of-tree driver. Now, since the company um, has gone out of business, somebody has taken up the torch of creating those drivers for those devices to continue ongoing support for Linux. But the very latest uh, long-term stable release of the Linux kernel, these drivers do not build against it. So we're kind of at a point where for those people with those devices, you're just going to have to stay on the older version of Unraid until that project, that community project of getting those drivers updated uh, takes place, at which point we can then incorporate them into a build. So something to just keep in mind, like how, how do I look out for these types of issues and pick my hardware uh, more intelligently? Generally speaking, uh, almost all Intel hardware is included in the Linux kernel. There are exceptions. And there are times where you will find a device, like specifically some network adapters, have both an in-tree and out-of-tree driver. And that could be for a number of reasons. One could be that they're wanting to test uh, new features in their driver code that they're not ready to submit to the Linux kernel yet. More often than not, it's because they have some kind of proprietary functionality that they're not wanting to put in the open source uh, driver. So then they create a closed source out of tree driver that extends that functionality. So there's sometimes reasons for that. But then when we look at a lot of other third party um, uh, vendors that make d uh, devices that have to have driver support, such as Realtek or um, uh, 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 who is the what's the storage one? I'm, I'm going to um, uh, not Mac store. I'm going to forget the storage one off the top of my head here. But there's a couple of of specific devices that uh, tend to have more out-of-tree driver builds. And those guys, you know, again, it's it's a crapshoot whether they stay in lockstep with the kernel. And sometimes what will happen is Linux will push out a long-term support kernel like they just recently did, and that fires off a starter pistol for all these companies with out-of-tree drivers to start have to worry about. Now, what those companies will do is they'll look at their users, they'll look at their customer base and say, okay, how many of these users are going to migrate to that platform and in what time frame? And then they have to make a judgment call for themselves how important it is to drop everything and go fix those driver problems for that new kernel release. Now, when we look at a lot of other distributions out there, there's plenty of, of Linux distributions out there that stay quite a ways behind on the kernel so as to prevent these types of hardware-specific issues from creeping up. But with Unraid, we want to stay bleeding edge because that's where all the new benefits come in. If you're running on a substantially older Linux kernel, A, a it's prone to bugs, and B, you're not being able to take advantage of all the latest features. And especially that that's true when it comes to new hardware. You know, whenever new hardware comes out, a lot of times you have to upgrade the kernel in order to take advantage of it. So what does this all really mean? Um, at the end of the day, when it comes to picking your hardware, the more standards-based hardware you can pick, the better off you'll be. The more hardware you can pick that has in-tree driver support that works to your satisfaction, the better off you will be. But if you happen to have a storage controller or a network controller or some other kind of device that requires an out-of-tree driver, and you know that, you just have to accept the fact that you may have to stay back behind on a couple releases of the OS 
uh, when major kernel upgrades take place. So, and we might be able to work in a solution in the future that helps these users be more aware of when these kind of problems uh, are, are coming up. But we'll have more news for you that on that in the future. So just wanted to throw this out there as a PSA because, you know, this creeps up on us from time to time and we are about to make a pretty big kernel change uh, in the 6.10 series. So for those of you that run into this problem, just be aware. And, and usually the simple workaround is to go and buy an alternative uh, uh, device to replace that if you are uh, hell-bent on being on the latest and greatest on raid release. So I hope you guys enjoyed today's episode. Uh, if you have comments on the metaverse or, or have your own thoughts about it, please comment them in uh, the, the comment section below. And as always, we will catch you guys on the next one.